Everybody? In case you're wondering, this is session 12, uh, climate change number one. Everybody in the right room? Am I in the right room? Yes. Okay, can you hear me in the back? All right, my name is Gordon Lepic. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife out of Eureka. And um, my job here uh, as co-chair is, I think, to say as little as possible, basically to introduce people and say thank you a lot. And so first off, I want to thank the Department of Fish and Wildlife for allowing me to put time and energy into this uh, session and to be here today. Um, I want to thank my co-chair, Brian Anniker from UC Davis, who could not be here today. Brian was amazing. We hooked up about a year ago to line up the speakers and um, Brian basically came up with just about everybody on the roster for these two sessions. And then, I, and then we said, well, so who's going to make the invitations? And Brian was like, well, uh, I'm going to see her tomorrow, and she's right down the hall, and um, I work with him. And so ba basically, Brian put the entire show together and can't be here. So, um, so a big shout out to Brian and her. And I want to thank all the presenters for, uh, for being here. A lot of work and time and energy went into them coming. Okay, uh, and I have one announcement, and that is uh, for the second session, the one o'clock uh, climate change, uh, Adelia Barber uh, had a, a major family event and had to cancel, so she will not be here. So we're going to start the one o'clock uh, climate change session at 1.20. Be forewarned. Come early and hang out or go somewhere, another talk. Okay, um, first talk, we've got five speakers, 20-minute uh, talks. I want to uh, welcome and uh, thank uh, Mark Schwartz. Uh, he's a professor of environmental science and policy uh, and director of the UC Davis John Muir Institute uh, of the Environment and associate editor of Conservation Letters. Mark, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I wanted to um, also echo this, that this is a really great lineup, and I'm, I'm honored to get to uh, kick it off and start us thinking about this issue of climate change in the floor of, of uh, California. And uh, so my title is Recent and uh, Future Climate Change in California Implications for Vegetation and Plants. And over on the left, you can see, well, there it is. The, the purple line is the squiggle of how temperatures have been changing uh, in California, as according to NOAA, it's about a degree Celsius. and the red dot over the side is the projection for uh, end of century uh, climate, three degrees. So uh, I'd like to be able to say that that's uh, all we can say about climate, but it is not. Uh, we have to think very carefully about what that means and uh, where it's likely to go and have impacts on the floor. So the outline uh, for the talk is, is really uh, this, how much has climate changed already? Uh, how much do we expect? Uh, what are the major uncertainties in future climate? Um, and then uh, what are the overarching projections for the impact of that on the California flora and how robust are those projections and where are we failing in, in our ability to make good projections and what's the prognosis for improved uh, predictive capacity. And I think that's what makes this uh, session really interesting because there's a lot of uh, people who are doing some very innovative work on this front that we'll be hearing from uh, for the remainder of the morning and the early afternoon. So uh, this is a graph put together by Jim Thorne that uh, uh, looks at uh, one way of, is, is one interesting way to look at how climate has been changing uh, in California over the 20th and early 21st century. These are the minimum uh, daily temperatures in the months of March, April, and November in uh, Yosemite Valley. And what you see is that Yosemite Valley uh, has gone from having March and April as winter months in the early part of the time spectrum uh, to being uh, not winter months or spring, uh, spring months uh, at the end of the sequence. In other words, the mean temperature, mean minimum temperatures have gone from below to above uh, freezing. Uh, and, and, and the same thing with November. November starts as a winter month and ends as a fall month. And so uh, you can look at this at, as an impact uh, throughout the Sierras and that's what's depicted in this graph on, on this, this map on the right, where uh, in the green area is areas where during the winter you have a, a between December, January, and February, you have uh, freezing nighttime temperatures, but early in the sequence and late in the sequence. And the purple 
You have above freezing temperatures early and late in the sequence, but the yellow represents the band that's transitioned from being something where you're dominated by winter, uh, you know, freezing temperatures during those winter months to those that are not. And so it's it's uh, uh, changing uh, ecological conditions uh, along with things like where you can grow citrus. Um, so we're now in the uh, realm of the CMIP-5, the new era of uh, climate models, and we have these now, these representative concentration pathways, and so we have to look at these uh, models a little bit differently, and this graph is an example of how that, this works, is that you, uh, along the x-axis, you're looking at uh, uh, time and the y-axis, atmospheric concentration of forcing gases, and that these different lines just represent how fast we move uh, along that pathway up into uh, you know, increasing atmospheric concentrations and then changing temperatures and precipitation as a consequence of that. We can look at that uh, with what we uh, expect to happen in California, and these are downscales of 17 global circulation models done by uh, Robert Hyman's, and that uh, each of these dots and the uh, um, error bars associated with that or the variation around that represent the mean prediction and the variation in that prediction of change in the state of California. So it's downscale for California. And you can see this represents the, the, the range of variation uh, uh, towards the end of the century under a high emission scenario, which is what we're effectively uh, in practice doing right now. And we see that then you have a three to six degree uh, projection of increase in temperature. Uh, but the interesting thing that comes out here is uh, that many, if not most, of those models uh, uh, cross that zero change in precipitation line. In other words, that most models predict that some parts of California will get wetter and some parts of California will get drier, that there's a lot of variation around that line, and that for California flora, this makes a, a potentially a huge difference in our predictions for future outcomes. So what is in question, what isn't in question with respect to uh, precipitation? So the future precipitation is uncertain, but water stress is less uncertain in that water stress, or the, uh, something suppressed by the Palmer Drought Severity Index, is um, uh, driven both by temperature and how much uh, rainfall there has been. And so uh, although precipitation through the 20th and early 21st century hasn't changed much, the impact of uh, dry years has gone up because of increasing temperatures, and this is why uh, this bar down here, which is the Palmer Drought Severity Index for 2013, is the most negative uh, in this recorded history and why we're thinking that this drought is more severe than any, any previous drought that we've experienced. And it, ostensibly, uh, earlier in the year, we were thinking about uh, having an El Nino year and that the predictions of El Nino have been weakening as we go along in this season. We started out well in northern California with respect to precipitation, but it hasn't been sufficient to uh, break the uh, drought. This is the Palmer Drought Severity Index uh, for California just three days ago. And the dark red is, um, is uh, what's it called? It's uh, exceptional drought. Uh, the bright red is extreme drought, and the orange is severe drought. And so virtually all of California is in severe drought or worse. And uh, it, for the last month or so, we've had above average temperatures. That's been this combination again of temperature and uh, precipitation. So the last month or so, between uh, just before Christmas to now, uh, above average temperatures, uh, below average uh, precipitation during that period. And we seem to have cycled into something that is likely uh, maybe a long-term persistent phenomena, but we've had now these dry Januaries for uh, most of the last decade or, or more. Uh, that this is uh, a, 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 a cumulative precipitation graph that the California Water uh, Resources uh, put together and puts out on a daily basis, done from eight Northern California stations, where the blue shaded area is the norm uh, for a year of precipitation, um, and starts at the beginning of the water year, and here's the wettest year on record, here's the driest year on record, this is last year uh, right there, and we started out, the dark blue line is this year, we started out quite well, but now we've been had a two or three week uh, dry period with no particular end of that in sight, best I can tell. But if you look at all these other years, even the 2010, 2011 year, the last year that we had a really uh, wet year, uh, we also had relatively dry, dry Januarys, and so we're actually entering, I think, a bimodal period of precipitation. And that we might be thinking about this very carefully when thinking about life histories, in particular like annual plants and things that are germinating, because 
it's often uh, that this early precipitation is what's triggering germination of a lot of, lot of invasive species and annual grasses, for example, uh, that are potentially competitors with our uh, native plants. And so thinking about that winter precipitation as a two-phase event might be a very useful way of thinking about it with respect to thinking about uh, plant responses. Uh, so, but what's going to happen with water is, is, is a big uh, uncertainty. So uh, this map on the left, this is the climate water deficit for a 10-year or 20-year, this is a 30-year average. Um, and you see that the climate water deficit in the northwest part of the state and the Sierra Nevada is very low and the deserts, of course, is very high. But the right graph is the one that's perhaps more interesting, and that looks at the variation in that climate water deficit over that time period. And we see that uh, what it shows is that the southeastern uh, part of the state, the deserts, uh, they have very uh, high water deficit and very low variance. In other words, they're consistently dry. And that uh, up in the northwest portion of the state, you have a uh, very low water deficit, and again, these dark blue or green colors represent that there will be low variation in that climate water deficit. But that you look at something like the Sierra Nevada and it lights up red in terms of that variation, that it can be both wet and dry, and that there's a lot of variation in the climate water deficit of those systems, and so they're highly variable systems. Well, thinking about what should happen to precipitation just on these first principles is, uh, is, is, is a rather confusing thing. So uh, in general ecology, I teach this uh, idea of where deserts are, and we think about Hadley cells, and it's, it's caused by uplifting air at the equator that, that drops a lot of its moisture, drifts north, settles out, and creates these very arid zones uh, at around 20 degrees latitude. And one of the things that climatologists tell us is that with the strengthening, with, with increasing greenhouse gases, we should have a strengthening of those Hadley cells, which should push that desertification and that aridity uh, northward, which is suggesting then a, a drier California, and, and that's the dominant thing in mostly Southern California. But people looking at the jet stream also suggest that the jet stream should be strengthening, which might drive uh, increasing uh, 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 raininess pushing down from the northwest, which is uh, what drives some of the uh, pred predictions of increasing precipitation in northern California. But that really, through most of the state, we're in this real big unknown zone. It could go either direction, and that is a real problem for us in terms of, of predicting uh, what happens to uh, uh, plants in the future. And then we have other problems that many of the global circulation models don't capture the desert monsoons very effectively. And yet the desert monsoons bring rain to the Sierra Nevada uh, in the summer and lightning and, 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 and ignitions of forests and things like this. So uh, the, the, this becomes a very difficult thing for climatologists to project, uh, predict into the future and makes it very difficult for us to think about plant responses. But we do know that the, the California flora, uh, based on models that we've had run so far, is in, is in deep trouble. So Scott Laurie and a, 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 a team of other researchers in 2008 looked at the 2,400 or so endemic plants, and uh, their findings suggested that up to two-thirds of those plants might experience an over 8% loss of their range within this next century. Uh, David Ackerley and others in 2010 Sajed looked at the climate envelopes of protected areas in California and Nevada and said that out of 500 protected areas, over 100 hectares in size, 492 of them will fall outside of the current climate envelope by the end of the century. In other words, they'll have different climate within the boundaries, so they'll be protecting something, but they may not be protecting the things that they're protecting now. Uh, and then we have this uh, idea that climate velocity uh, may be very high in areas with this changing climate and that many species will not be able to track those climate changes with uh, dispersal. And that fire and, uh, and invasive species are both increasing and creating, creating increasing stress. Um, you know, you look at this and it makes me want to run straight downstairs to the bar and drink, start drinking <laughs> now. <laughs> it's bad. And, um, and you know, so, so I, I think, well, is there, is there room for optimism regarding resilience? And I think the answer is, is yes, but it's going to be a very complicated thing. And so uh, bear with me while I tell this story about Scriptanthus niger for a moment. This is a, 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 a endemic of Ring Mountain. It, it grows on these bald areas right in here, which are serpentine uh, patches. And it has a very narrow distribution. You're looking at it. And that if any kind of model that we have I would suggest that the climate of that spot is what it grows in, and any climate that's different than the climate of that spot is not where it grows. And so in doing a model of this, we're saying, well, that's 
that's good climate and everything else is poor climate. And we project the future of that species and suggest that it's in deep, deep trouble because the climate of that spot in the future won't be the climate that's there now. But in reality, that spot is, uh, gets a sampling of different kind of climates from year to year. And there are probably some years that are good years that have a, a fitness of lambda greater than one. But there are other years that are undoubtedly bad years. There are years where you don't get precipitation and it doesn't produce much seed, or they don't germinate, or they don't even start. They don't, uh, uh, and, and so uh, those would be bad years. And so we can think about the history of this plant being something like this, that there's some frequency distribution of kinds of years that it gets. And maybe most years are, are good for it, and it gets a few bad years. This is just hypothetical. I just threw those out there. We don't know. It might even be a minority of years that, they get to, that, that there are good years. Uh, but that in the future, if the change is, uh, there's a change in climate, we might think instead of it being good to not existent, that the, 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 the climate might be such that you have an increase in frequency of years that are not uh, adequate for it to uh, reproduce and maintain its population, but you're likely to have some years where it still might. And thinking about the variation of climate around the site is really probably pretty important for these narrow endemics and thinking about their potential to persist through time. And so this gives me optimism that there may be more capacity for resilience among these narrowly endemic species than, than we might give them credit for in sort of the simple way that we, we traditionally model species distributions by looking at the mean values of the climate for those areas. Another story uh, is, is, has, is, is, I think, is an emerging one, and that we have a lot of things that where we're really poor at projecting some regional climatic phenomena that are pretty important to us. And so a few years back, I um, started wondering about this. We had these unusually cool summers in um, San Francisco, and I started thinking about longshore winds and upwelling, and started talking to people out of Bodega Bay, and they had data that suggested these longshore winds and upwelling had been increasing for about a decade or so. And uh, sure enough, over the last year, there have been a couple papers now, uh, one of them by Cinnamon et al., uh, looked at uh, longshore winds and upwelling uh, over the past decade, and many places they have a statistical increase in the rate of that upwelling. And that includes California, but not all the global upwelling zones. Uh, regional downscale climate uh, projections are starting to indicate that this upwelling may be just may be continuing, and as a consequence of that, uh, driving more uh, upwelling and longshore winds. Well, what those things do is they bring in and create fog, and fog has the capacity to cool uh, the coast of California. Now, what the actual implication of this? It's way too premature to say, uh, but. It seems to me that these things that cannot be captured in global models that we might be able to capture now in these regionally downscaled models may end up giving us significantly different projections of future temperatures than what we have uh, now, particularly in some of these areas like the coast of California where we have an awful lot of those endemic plants. And then uh, this is a, a story that's just emerging just in the last couple months, and it has to do with some work I've been involved with that isn't so much giving us um, confidence or, or in potential resilience, but giving us um, a bit of humility in the capacity to predict. So we've been working with Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks to project uh, the forest, forest resilience to climate change in the future. And we did these climate envelope models, very simple stuff, basically saying for the period 1970 to 2000, where are all the distributions of sequoia groves uh, in, uh, in, uh, in climatic space? And, and then contour that, and then on that same projection, uh, uh, look at where those points fall in projections of future climate space. So all the red points out here represent places that are currently sequoia groves that by the end of the century, we anticipate being outside the climatic envelope of where sequoia groves grow, grow and we call them then exposed to change. Well, this last couple years has been an opportunity to look at stress and, and sensitivity of sequoias. And Nate Stevenson and Adrian and, uh, Das at uh, USGS down at uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park just did this gummy worm-like uh, diagram where they went around and surveyed uh, needle damage and needle loss uh, on, on, on big trees. And, uh, you know, there, and the orange colors and red colors, those are areas where there's high needle loss and the blue and green ones are low needle loss. We can then compare it to our projection of sensitivity of those growths. And uh, I'm happy to report that it's a significant 
positive relationship between our projection and their uh, outcome. It explains 4% of the variation, right? So there's more going on there than just this climate model, and that we have a lot to understand. It could be subsurface hydrology, but we have a lot to learn about what's, go what's going on there. So I, I just want to point out that this is because it's done with four climate stations in that area, and our goal is to take what little information and project what we know about that as a consequence. And you know, when we have a homogeneous landscape, that might be relatively easy. But when we have a heterogeneous landscape, we're going to get things badly wrong, and uh, and we may be doing that. So um, uh, I just want to conclude by uh, saying that climate change poses a significant threat. Uh, that the uncertainty uh, in these models is high. But there's a lot of clever people out there looking at this in a number of clever ways, and we're going to hear about some of them uh, for the remainder of this session. So I, I look forward to this, and thank you for your attention.